The following story was submitted to us. The story itself was verified with screenshots, payment details, which included her bank details, the bank details of several other people. This story includes mentions of black magic and oaths as a theory as to why this target victim sent so much money. This story is in her own words, and the only edits to this story was the name of the victim and her family information, her husband's name, and her location to help hide her identity and for her own safety. And a few edits to keep it YouTube friendly, we edited it out, any curse words, etc. This story has taken me roughly a month to record and review. It's complex. It's a bit shocking what someone would do to be with someone they think they love. While I know this story will be met with some negative comments with regards to the lady who shared it, this is not uncommon. In the over 10 years we've been helping romance scam victims, this type of situation happens more often than many people realize. This will be in two parts due to the length of her story and the recording that it took to do each part. This is part one. I gave away $1 million in three years. I can only imagine what people will say about my story. I want to share it despite the backlash I'm sure will occur. I don't know how many of you believe in a dark force or dark magic, but what I went through in three years, it was like being in a haze. This took place over a three-year span. I met George in 2017. I was on FB when I received a message from a man named George. He said he was searching for an old friend when he came across my profile and just felt compelled to message me and introduce himself. During this time in my life, I was married, but in an unhappy marriage. A loveless marriage for years and years when George messaged me telling me how beautiful he thought my profile photo was and how he just had to message me. Honestly, I was quite flattered. Now, this is not all it took to make me throw away my life savings, but I admit he was very charming with his introductions. He came to me as a gentle and kind man. He told me he was 48 years old and I was 54 at the time. I had been married for 27 years. My husband and I built a good life, a nice home that was paid for. We had nice cars for each of us. Those were paid for too. We had investments, 401k retirements. I worked at the time for the County Transit Authority when I met George. I've been working for the county for over 20 years, so I was a higher paid employee with great benefits coming my way for my future. My ultimate goal was to work for six more years and take early retirement. My husband worked for a steel mill as a foreman, and he was really smart with money. So financially, we were living the so-called American dream. Our marriage, however, was lacking love, affection, time together. I worked. He worked. Weekends were spent with him and his buddies on the couch watching football in the winter, baseball in the summer. My husband was an avid collector of sports memorabilia. In fact, one room of our home had nothing but sports memorabilia, signed baseballs by legendary players, jerseys, cards, you name it, my husband had it. He loved sports, and as the years in our marriage went on, sports became his mistress. I had tried in the past to talk to him about my feelings, how I felt neglected, but I was often met with being shined on, ignored, or simply told a few times that I was just hormonal. It was insulting. George came into my space and my head, and eventually my heart, at a time when I was desperate to hear all the things my husband never said to me. I'm not trying to justify my actions. I'm simply trying to paint a picture to your viewers of my home life situation when I met George. George told me he was divorced, that his wife of 20 years had cheated on him with his best friend three years prior and he had to divorce her, and she took everything he had. George said he was working for and owned a securities company and was contracted to do security work in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other unsafe war-torn locations. He said he owned the company and had about 400 employees. He said he had a daughter named Terry who was 18 years old and away at school. 
We chatted in Messenger the first couple of days we had met online. He was not a friend on my FB, but simply a Messenger friend. He never sent me a friend request the first few days we had chatted. During this time, I knew absolutely nothing about romance scammers or anything on the subject. In 2017, I didn't hear much about romance scams, and I never really had a need to search the subject at all. George would message me every morning and wish me a great day. It was a very innocent friendship. I was open with George and told him that I'm a married woman, but I explained to him that the marriage was broken and my husband and I only shared our home. Half the time, my husband would go out after work. He was a sports bar fly. He would stay there for hours after work to watch sports with his friends. My husband was a regular at the local sports places, so it's not like I came home and cooked dinner and we had a marriage with lovey-dovey closeness. Half the time, I would sleep downstairs on the couch because he would come home after a late night at the sports bar and watch TV in the bedroom. I don't know why with George I felt the need to share so much and so many of my deep thoughts and problems. Maybe because George wasn't physically in front of me, so I didn't have to hide my head in shame over my marriage or my thoughts. It was like he cared and I felt safe with him. I don't typically share my problems with my closest friends. No one at work knew my marital struggles. My family didn't either. They just saw my husband Martin and I as a longtime married couple, like two peas in a pod. With George, though, I poured my deepest thoughts and my heart out to him. In return, he listened. He told me stories of how his ex-wife cheated and how betrayed he felt, how he cried and begged for her not to go with another man, and she did. Then they divorced. How it broke his daughter's heart. How he fought for custody of his teenage daughter. How hard he worked to provide for her, send her to a private school, and make sure she had everything she needed. How he worked in a dangerous location to ensure he would take bigger contracts that paid out. He even told me how he was detained in another country by dangerous groups of militants and he had to escape. He sacrificed everything for the love of his daughter. It was so weird how we became close within a matter of weeks. We ended up chatting on Messenger for a couple of weeks before he asked for my phone number so we could talk. I was hesitant at first. Chatting on Messenger about our problems was one thing, but to give him my phone number, that was another. He told me that he lived in Florida, but was going on a contract again to Afghanistan and asked me to download Viber app so we could exchange numbers and call and talk and message there in the event his FB was closed due to security reasons. I live in Missouri, and I felt like he was far enough away, and with him going to Afghanistan again, that we would probably never meet, so we exchanged numbers and I downloaded the Viber chat app. The same consistency went on with us downloading the app. George would message me every morning, during my lunch break, and then during the evenings, and the night was hard for me because most times... I was here alone in this house. George knew my husband was always out, and George never failed to message me and tell me I was beautiful and tell me he was thinking of me, and he missed me. George was packing for his trip to Kabul when he was on a security detail. He even sent me photos of his suitcase, his weapons, his armor, everything he would have to wear. He said he was in charge of security for a military installation protecting a construction company whose workers were building back the country, and there was a danger, so him and 12 of his employees were going to protect the construction site. He was slated to be there for three months, then returned back to Florida before being assigned on another contract in another country. I told George that I was worried for his safety, but George was a bodybuilder with big muscles, and he told me he knew jiu-jitsu and karate, and he was a black belt in both. He worked out all the time. The night before he left for Kabul, we texted late into the night. I stayed up, I remember, till like 3 or 4 in the morning texting with him. I went to work the next day exhausted. As most days, I had to be to work at 7 a.m. But I just felt so safe with him. And when we talked, time simply melted away. 
George messaged me when he was boarding his flight to London, and then he would fly to Germany and then to Kabul. He kept me updated as he flew, sending photos of the airports he was in, telling me where he was, how much he missed our chats, and he would talk to me when he was settled in his campsite in Kabul. I was worried sick for his safety, but reminded myself this is what he did for a living. He knew what he was doing. I noticed changes in myself as my friendship with George played out. I would care less about my husband not being home after work, and I cared less about the house. My job, it was just a place to be until I could go home and talk to George again. I can't seem to explain it, but George was in my every thought. George texted me a photo of his barracks where he was staying in Kabul. It looked like a military setting, but he assured me he was safe and things were calm there for the moment. We spent that night texting. George knew I had to work the next day, but I didn't care. We texted and texted. He told me about his family and how his mom and dad were from Germany, but they had passed away when he was 19 and he moved to the States on a karate grant to compete and train at a school in Florida. He was so good he nearly went to the Olympics, but instead he got into security training and once he got his black belt in karate, he went into the security school and then started training and bodybuilding. He said due to him being from Germany then immigrating to the USA, the army wouldn't allow him to join due to some paperwork issue. And they had told him once that the paperwork was sorted, but he was too dangerous for the military and they refused his enlistment application due to him being an expert martial artist and all his security training, the military told him he would be a threat to national security. So instead, he started his own security company and obtained other employees and contracts so he could advance his career. George and I texted till around 5 in the morning. That's when he finally called me and we spoke on the phone. The connection was a bit choppy, but I finally got to hear this man's voice. He had the most beautiful accent, which I thought was some kind of German or Eastern European. He almost sounded French. He had a very deep voice, which I felt like put me in a trance. I listened to him talk and tell me how good I made him feel, how much he cared for me, how he wished I wasn't married because he would give me the world. He poured his heart out and left me in tears from his kindness. We talked that first time till around 6.30 in the morning. I told him I had to go to work, and he told me I should stay home and rest. I actually ended up calling in sick to work. My husband didn't even notice until he saw my car in the driveway. It was blocking his truck, and he asked me why I wasn't at work. I told him I was sick. His response to me was, well, move your car. It's in my way. I moved my car and went back to the house and called George back. We talked for another hour before we hung up. During this chat, George told me that he wanted to make me his. He wanted a serious relationship with me. I told George that I would want the same, but I'm a married woman, even if I'm unhappily married. He kept pouring his heart out and told me to think it over. I remember sleeping half the day, then going out. I bought some new clothes and I had my hair done. I just felt like a new woman with George, and I took the time to really think over things. That night, my husband came home and never asked how I was feeling, didn't notice that my hair was done. He had two of his buddies from work over to watch a game. I found myself wanting to be away, and I would often either spend time in the spare room, or more often than not, when my husband and his sports parties and buddies were there, I would take my car, go to the park, and sit and talk to George. Or I would end up in a coffee shop and spend time there texting, sometimes calling with George. He would call me all the time after patrol, after work, when he was in the barracks. He would ask me if I thought about accepting his proposal to have a relationship with him. He kept telling me that we need to make an oath to be together. It was a word I hadn't used or really heard. He used it often, saying, let's make this oath to be together once and for all, only for one another. George wore on my heart, and I finally told him I'd like a relationship with him. He had me say an oath with him. 
I thought he'd been joking or it was just a word that he used, but over voice chat, he had me repeat this oath three times. Now, I don't recall the exact wording, but it was something about swearing allegiance to him and only him, and he would swear it to me. So be it. I know those were not the exact words, but he had me, as I said, repeat it three times. During this, I thought it was just a cute little thing. Since he wasn't here in the physical presence, it was like his version of a promise ring. Over the coming days, my mind was just engulfed in thoughts of George. He would send me photos of himself and his security details, working out and staying busy. In return, I'd send him photos of myself too. We would text nearly every single night. I would work, come home, take a nap, and then text all night with George. My husband was so caught up in the playoffs that he hardly noticed. He did ask me once why I was taking naps in the afternoon and evenings after work. I lied to him and told him that we're shorthanded at work and I've been taking extra duties and routes. He would shrug and continue with his sports fanatical life. If he wasn't watching sports, he was in his memorabilia room looking at all his stuff. As crazy as this might sound, I felt obsessed with George. My husband had plans to have a big Super Bowl party with his friends from work. Normally in years past, I would cook platters of food and help stock the fridge with food. This year I did the grocery shopping but told him I'm tired from work and he should just order pizza or do something else that I'd be upstairs napping during the Super Bowl party he was having. Honestly, in years past, his parties were always fueled by screaming, jumping, and arguments as he would go overboard if his team lost or missed a play. Mix that with friends and drinks and it's a disaster. I told George I'll be waiting for his call upstairs. During the Super Bowl party, it was noisy and I knew my husband wouldn't hear me upstairs talking. George called on cue. We chatted, and he told me about some security breaches that they had had and how armed groups tried to enter the construction compound. My heart sank thinking of him in harm's way. He told me he was safe, but the contract didn't include this type of danger. He writes the contracts out and is told the situation prior to agreeing. This time he wasn't told how dangerous it would be. I remember crying, feeling so upset because he was in serious danger. George asked me if I would be able to get him an iTunes card to keep his phone going. Several times during the chat, our phone would cut on and off, and he said it was due to not loading a card. I told him I'll do anything for him, and he asked me for a $100 iTunes card or whatever I felt I could get him. I told him that I could go tomorrow morning and get him one, as I didn't feel like going back out. I was in my sweats and house clothes and didn't want to get made up to go out. George was silent and then he asked me if I truly loved him as he loved me. It was the first time I had heard him say that and I told him of course I loved him. He was silent and then said we had an oath. We have an oath together to be forever. He then asked me to go get him a card right now. I can't explain to you how or why, but I told him I would and I hung up and went out to the store in my sweats, my slippers, an oversized shirt, and got an iTunes card. Now, I never go out without being dressed nice. It's just a thing I've done all my life. However, I just felt this force making me go out. Maybe it was his charms, his words, but I walked right out of the house to the store and bought a $100 iTunes card, came right back home, walked past my husband and his friends, which he didn't bat an eye, went upstairs, scratched the card, and messaged George. It was like I was on autopilot. I continued talking to George on the phone, who thanked me for the card, and then he asked me what the noise was. By this time, my husband was screaming like an awkward drunkard at the TV, his team was losing and he was getting loud. I told George, that's my husband yelling at the TV. George told me I deserve better and he would never act like that. I knew or thought at the time George was such a good man. He told me to be safe and that he had to go on patrol, but he would message me late that night, my time. He blew me kisses from the phone. I did the same and we hung up. I sat there for a few moments realizing I was really in love with George. I hated my life. 
my living situation, and everything that surrounded it. I wanted to scream, but instead I would sit in silence, take a deep breath, and go downstairs. The game was over, my husband's team lost, and I was heading downstairs as I quietly picked up the cups, the bottles, and the spilled food and started cleaning up. My husband was yelling and tossing our couch pillows around, saying he could have won the game himself. My husband's friends left, telling me to have a good night, and I waved them off, as if to say, don't worry, I can handle it. I remember scurrying into the kitchen, cleaning, and making myself busy. My husband was still yelling about the game, yelling to me to clean up the mess in the house. He looked at me, asking where I was. I told him I wasn't feeling well and I had taken a nap. He then started going on and on again about the game, fumbling with the TV remote and yelling. I was so blank and emotionless over the entire situation before me. My mind was on George. I looked at my husband in his state, his shirt with food spilled all over it. My living room was a mess. My husband went upstairs to bed. I cleaned the house dreaming of a better life with George. My husband was sound asleep. I sat on the couch. George called me late that night on cue. He said he had a rough time on patrol, but asked how I was. I told him what my husband did, and he was angry. I changed the subject, and everything went back to the talk of romance and love. George got explicit that night about what he would do when we're together, and I felt his genuine desire for me. Over the next couple of weeks, we would talk about meeting. When George's contract was over, he would be returning to Florida. His daughter would be out on spring break. George asked me if I wanted to meet him and his daughter. He had sent me pictures of his house in Florida, and I told him I'd have to think about it. This was taking things into the real world, not just an online romance and fantasy. I told George I'll have to consider this, and George reminded me that we took an oath to be together forever. He would remind me of this often while he was romantic, and I found this odd. George told me that I would make the right decision. Over the next few nights after George and I would text or voice call, I would have wild dreams. I've never been an avid person to remember my dreams, but I would dream about weird things. I would dream of fires and hooded figures, dream of traveling to places, and I couldn't explain where they were. I would have nightmares of being chased by people, all kinds of crazy stuff. I thought maybe lack of sleep caused this, or sleeping a few hours, going to work, napping. Maybe my whole body was off. George would ask me every week or so for an iTunes card. He said he used them to load time on his phone while in Kabul, and that it was too dangerous to leave the construction compound or camp. I would buy these $100 cards without a thought, as if I was buying gumball out of a machine. My car was loaded with these cards in the glove box on the floorboards. I probably spent around $3,000 buying iTunes cards, $100 at a time. I wanted to keep talking to George. I craved talking to him, and he told me the cards would give him time to use his phone. So after all-night conversations, I would go and buy him another card. Sometimes he wouldn't ask, and I'd just buy them, but most times he would ask for them. It got to the point that the corner mini mart I would buy them from ran out of cards, so I would have to go to a big box store and buy more. I was a fiend for iTunes cards and George to call me. Him and I would talk for hours or text when we couldn't voice chat. The cards became a financial burden and I started to pick up extra routes and work more hours to supplement the card buying. One night George didn't call me or answer my text. I was extremely concerned. He had always called. I texted, but they went on red. I was like a cat on a hot tin roof and would jump at every sound, thinking it was my phone and George. But it wasn't. Two whole days went by before I heard from George. I was in tears when he called. He said there was an ambush and a security breach in the compound, and he was attacked by someone. He sent me photos of his injured leg, and it looked like he'd been cut. He told me he was rushed to hospital in Kabul outside of the compound, but that it was unsafe for him as people were looking for him and that a few of his workers had gone missing. George said he needs to be transported to a hospital in Germany, but the government in Afghanistan is demanding payment for the transportation. He said his leg was in bad shape and he needed $5,000 for the evacuation flight to Berlin to secure the hospital stay. 
he needed out of Kabul. He asked me if I could help him by paying the transportation pilot to fly him from Kabul, then to Berlin. He was crying on the phone saying his passport and identification security card were missing and he thinks the people who ambushed his crew had taken everything. George begged me and I told him I'd have to go to the bank and asked how can I send the money. He told me that I would have to send a bank transfer. Well, my husband and I have a joint account, so I really couldn't do that. George became frustrated and, and told me he was in dire health and he was unsure if he could make it as he needs adequate medical attention and in Kabul, there's no good hospitals to treat him. He said he felt very weak. He hung up on me and I went into panic mode. I tried calling him back, but there was no answer. I texted George and told him I'll get the money tomorrow. How could I send it to a bank transfer? I heard nothing. I cried myself to sleep that night and I had nightmares of George, of losing him. That next morning I went to work and I finally got a text, but it wasn't George. It was a man calling himself Columbus, who said George had slipped into a coma from the infection in his leg and they needed to do an emergency flight evacuation as he needed treatment. I told this man I would help. I can get the 5000 but I wasn't sure how to do a bank transfer as my husband and I have a joint account. Columbus told me that the cost would now be $15,000 because it's an emergency and he will need treatment while on the flight to save his life. My head was spinning and my heart sank. I was at work trying to do my job and deal with this. Columbus told me that there was only one way to send the money. It would have to go to the pilot who would then make the arrangement to do the emergency medevac flight. He gave me the name of a man in Berlin, Germany, who was the pilot for the medical emergency flight crew. He told me to bank transfer the money and show proof of the transfer so they can arrange the flight path. I told this Columbus person that I was at work, and he told me, George has no time. I need to hurry. I wrote the information down and told my boss I needed to leave work for a family emergency. At this point, my thoughts were on George. I went to my bank and pulled out our savings, which was a joint account with my husband. My husband typically only looked into the checking account to pay bills, and he never checked into savings that often. So I pulled the money from there and did a wire transfer to this man in Berlin through my bank. I told the teller it was a family emergency that my father had gone to Germany and gotten sick. The teller did a few pages of paperwork, gave me a receipt. In my head, I figured I could work extra hours, maybe sell a few personal items to gain back that money before my husband noticed it was gone. He would check savings maybe twice a year when it got close to him hosting another sports party at the house. He would always pull a thousand or so out to buy food and drinks for his sports parties. I knew I'd be safe for a while as the Super Bowl had finished. I texted George's phone, which Columbus was using to talk to me, and showed him the transfer information. Within hours, he said George was on a flight to Berlin, and he sent me a photo of George in a hospital bed. He said he was in bad shape and I should pray for him. I asked for the name of the hospital. Columbus told me that due to security risk, they had to take him into protective custody and couldn't disclose the hospital, but they would keep me informed. It was four whole days before I heard from George's number. The phone rang and I picked up thinking it was George. It was not. It was a man calling himself Dr. Benton. He introduced himself and told me that George was in bad shape and needed emergency surgery to fix his leg and asked me if I'd be paying for the procedure to fix it. I told him that George owns a security company. He likely has a bank account. I asked to speak to George and the doctor told me George was still in a medically induced coma as he needed this emergency surgery. The doctor told me it would be $3,000 for the surgery and asked me if I'd be able to secure the payment. I told the doctor I'd reach out to the embassy and the doctor told me the embassy was closed as it was the weekend. He needed the surgery right now. The doctor told me I could send the money through a bank transfer. I told the doctor I cannot do that due to personal reasons and bank transfers are not an option. I didn't want to get into it with the doctor about me being a married woman. I didn't know what to do. I was scared and I felt like I was losing George. The doctor said he normally doesn't allow this, but that I could wire the money through a transfer service to an agent 
who can then do the bank transfer. He gave me the name of a woman in California who he could have the money sent to, and then she could send it to the hospital via her own bank. He told me George was slipping away, his blood pressure was falling. I told the doctor, I'll send the money, and he gave me the woman's name and city and told me to do it through a money transfer service. I ended up taking some of my jewelry to a pawn shop and getting the cash for a loan. I plan to get my jewelry back, though. I got close to $3,000 for my rings and bracelets and the rest, which, if I recall, was around $200 short. I went to a check-cashing place across town and wired the money. I tried calling George's number, but no one answered. I then received a text asking for the MTCN for the transfer I did. I had to scramble to get those extra $200, but I was able to make it. I gave the number, and I waited. Waited, and waited some more. During this whole ordeal, I seriously had no reality. I was rushing around town, sending money, pawning stuff, disregarding my job and home. My thoughts were only on George. I would go to bed praying for him. I would dream of him and then have nightmares of people chasing me, gorish nightmares of distorted faces and monsters. It was so weird. In my life, I've never had such dreams. I chalked it up to stress. Two more days passed before I received a call from George. He was very weak sounding, but he said he was awake, but so weak. I could barely hear him. He hung up several times. He called back, but it was the doctor. He told me George was very weak, but his leg was repaired and he was doing much better thanks to me. I bawled my eyes out, crying tears of joy, love, and happiness, knowing he'd be okay. The doctor said he'll make it and make a full recovery, but it'll take weeks before he'd be able to walk again. George and I would talk night and day as he grew stronger, professing our love for each other. This event made me realize truly how much I love this man. I told George I would look into a divorce attorney and leave my husband. George cried and told me he would give me the world and he would also pay me back once he returned home. I told George just focus on getting stronger. The doctor would call me from his personal number, which was a German country code number, and update me on George's progress. The doctor told me that he could tell I really loved him and he really loved me. He said all George does is talk about how much he loves me and tells me and everyone in the hospital that I'm his wife. I ended up calling a divorce attorney for a consultation on how to go about my divorce. It would be complicated as my husband and I have a lot of financial investments and retirement accounts, the house, so many financial ties, and if my husband contests the divorce, I could lose everything, especially if he found out about my infidelity, be it an online affair. I had a lot to think about and how to do this. The divorce attorney told me I could lose everything. As George grew stronger, I told him what the divorce attorney said. We came up with a plan to have a secret bank account that I could start filtering some money into to hide money and leave my husband. George said he would wait forever for me. He would be in the hospital a while longer. He said his daughter was worried sick as she was away at school and missed spring break with him because of the injury. George suggested I email his daughter and introduce myself. He said he had told his daughter all about me. I told him I would send her an email so we can all be looped in on his recovery and progress, and when he returns to Florida, his daughter would take a leave from school to see her father, George, and help him recover at home. I started to email his daughter, who was away at school. She was studying to become a nurse. She was in a private school. She told me that her father was in love with me and she couldn't wait to meet me, but she was having issues at school. When I asked her what was going on, she told me that her father had forgotten to pay her quarterly school tuition fee and she was afraid to tell him because he's dealing with his health issues at the hospital. She said she was going to be kicked out of nursing school unless the quarterly tuition was paid by next Friday. I told her that I would talk to her father about it, but she begged me not to. She didn't want to burden him with it, and she would end up dropping out of school. I told her, no, that's not an option. She then told me that some friends of hers make money for school by dancing in a nightclub. I asked her if she meant like a gentleman's club, and she said it was a club where older men pay for dances. 
I told her absolutely not. I'll talk to George about the tuition. She typed back to me in an email in all caps, begging me not to tell because the stress could cause a setback in her father's recovery and she'll just work nights in the club. She said the tuition was $5,000. I told her we can figure this out together and she had until next Friday. We kept this a secret from George. The next day, my husband and I had a huge argument. I told him that we should consider divorcing, that it had crossed my mind in the past, and that we even talked about this in the past. This time, my husband told me absolutely not and accused me of having an affair. The fear of losing the money I invested and we worked so hard to build scared me. The attorney's advice scared me, and my husband didn't know that I had consulted an attorney. I told him I wasn't having any affair and that we'd just grown apart. My husband would yell and scream at me before leaving the house to go to his sports bar. I was upset, scared, angry at how he treats me. Here I have George, a kind, soft, loving man, and his daughter, and I would email her often. They both treated me with kindness, and George was so loving, even through the injury of his leg. When George was injured, I truly realized how much I loved him. I looked around and became more angry at my situation. I was miserable at home. I was worried about his daughter, and she would email me every day telling me that she had to get the tuition or she would be in danger of having to work at the dance club. I didn't want that for her. I knew that those clubs are full of dirty men, and George's daughter was a beautiful young woman, and a nightclub or a gentleman's club, that's no place for a nursing school student. She belongs in school. I tried to come up with ways to get the money for her school. By this time, I was a good $25,000 invested between paying for the hospital flight and the iTunes cards. With her tuition, I would be about $30,000, give or take, invested in this relationship. My husband and I had another huge argument. By this time, he was spending his nights at the sports bars with his buddies. He would come home late. I was angry. He wouldn't discuss the divorce without accusing me of an affair and telling me that if I divorced him, he'd make sure I was left with nothing. By this time, George was doing better, but still in the hospital. His daughter would check in with me and gave me the name of a bank account where the tuition would need to be paid. It was a school name and a bank account that ended with an LLC. She begged me and then told me if she couldn't get her tuition paid in two days, then her friend at school would get her into the club. I went to my husband's sports room and went through his boxes of sports cards. He had tons of cards, magazines, jerseys, all sorts of stuff. I started to check what some of it was worth. I found a couple of his cards in a catalog that were worth quite a bit. I knew his entire sports collection was worth around $40,000 as we had it insured years ago in the event of a fire. I took four of his sports cards to a sports dealer which was three hours from our town. I didn't want to take the cards to a pawn shop or a local sports memorabilia dealer, as my husband likely knew some of them. When I took the cards to the sports buyer, he told me the four cards together were worth roughly $4,000. I could get 1000 each with his offer. I would also have to fill out a bunch of paperwork if I sold them. I didn't want to do this, but I at least got a quote on their worth. Disappointed and desperate, I went to a few local buy and sell groups online. Nothing my husband was in, and I posted the cards for sale, but I stated I was from a town five hours from where I'm really from. I was desperate to get the money for George's daughter's tuition. If push came to shove, I'd find a way. I didn't want her working in a nightclub. I got an offer for two of the cards from a guy online who lived six hours from me. I asked $2,500 for two cards, and he wanted them to complete his collection. I ended up making arrangements to drive there and meet him in a shopping center. I told my husband I'd be working extra shifts, and I drove the six hours each way to meet a stranger to sell his cards. Thankfully, the guy was the real deal, and he met me at a shopping center parking lot, and we exchanged the money for the cards. He told me it completed his lifelong collection. I lied and told the guy that my father left me the cards and I had to sell them to pay for his medical bills he left behind. This is not the kind of person I was before I met George. I can't explain how I felt like I was in a daze doing this all. 
This left me two more cards, which got no interested buyers. I told George's daughter I got half of her tuition money and I'll send half. And then if the school can wait a few more days, I'll send the rest. She was overjoyed and she said she spoke to the school and they said they could accept that. I transferred the $2,500, then drove into the next state to sell the other two cards to a sports memorabilia store buyer in a bigger town. I ended up getting $1,800 for both cards, which left me a bit short, but my paycheck I was able to take some out and complete the $2,500 to pay for the rest of her tuition. Now, many are probably thinking, wouldn't my husband notice the cards are gone? Well, yes and no. He didn't look at his sports cards as much as they were stored in a box in the closet. While they were numbered, he more or less would go into the room and look at his jerseys, basketballs, footballs, baseballs that he had autographed, and more. Those he'd noticed were missing before anything else. George's daughter had her tuition paid. George was recovering and making plans to fly home to Florida, and we were making plans to meet. I told my husband I was having to go to St. Louis, which was four hours away from my training recertification for work, and I'd have to be gone for eight days. He never questioned it, and I did recertify every three years for work. George would fly home soon, and he asked me to wait before visiting as his daughter was coming to visit, and he wanted a little time with his daughter and to get his affairs in order, his house cleaned that had been sitting for months, and have some time to sort through his contracts as he was owed his money. He had to replace his documents that had gone missing as well. He told me he would be home for at least four months and to please wait. I told him I'd wait for his signal, then make plans to take time off work, book a flight. I just needed a couple of weeks notice. George flew home to Florida and he told me that the insurance paid his flight home finally and he was sorting his legal documents and as soon as he got paid he would pay me back for everything I'd done for him. He still didn't know though that I had paid his daughter's tuition. George and I talked nightly during my lunch breaks at work. I felt like I was in a daze, like I was possessed, and my only thoughts were George. I would go to work like I was on autopilot. I couldn't even recall most days. My focus was George, the love of my life. I was still having nightmares, and I would tell George about them, and he told me it's just stress. And a few times he would laugh. That hurt my feelings as I truly was losing sleep and having nightmares and very gory dreams. George and I spent as much time together as we could. We were like a couple in every sense. He even sent me some X-rated photos of himself and I did the same. I also sent him some video. I was crazy in love with this man. I did things on video and sent pictures that I've never done before. I've always been very reserved, but with George I felt free and felt that desire that I haven't felt in decades. My home life was non-existent at this point. I would work, come home, go to the guest room, talk to George. My husband would work, come home, leave for the sports bar, and we'd ignore each other. He kept accusing me of having an affair, so I flipped the script on him and started accusing him of having an affair. A few times I accused him of cheating on me with a waitress at a sports bar. I really had no idea. I was just grasping at straws to hurt his feelings as he had hurt mine. This was as toxic at home as it could get. George said he was getting his contract sorted and his daughter was with him. He sent me pictures of him and his daughter together. I was planning to visit, buying sexy clothes, beach clothes, a new suitcase. I couldn't wait to be with him. George told me he had a surprise for me. He wanted to marry me and he bought me a ring. I told him I'm not divorced yet and explained how I would likely lose everything in my divorce. George told me he put in for his retirement and also to get paid for his last contract. He said he realized how much he loved me and this injury while at work made him see how precious life is and that he doesn't want to work in the security industry anymore. He wants to retire and asks me if I want to move to Florida to live with him. Even if I lost everything in the divorce, he would have me and I would take care of him and he would take care of me. He said his contract once paid would be for over a million dollars. He promised me he would take care of me. 
I told George I'd marry him once my divorce was final and yes, I'll move to Florida. I kept working. I started selling things that I didn't need. George told me to start selling everything. I did lose my pawn shop loan for my jewelry, but I wasn't even mad. I considered selling my wedding ring, but I wanted to wait until my divorce was finalized. I spoke again to the attorney, and I consulted her before, and I told her that I want to drop divorce paperwork. My attorney was hired, and she sent and went over my investments with my husband. I was honest with my attorney and told her that I'd met someone else and I want out of the marriage. My attorney drew up paperwork, and she told me when I was ready, we could serve my husband. I waited until after I met George as my plan. I had a secret bank account that only George and I knew about, and I was shuffling money into a nest egg for my escape. I started to pawn and sell things. George suggested that I start sending money to his accountant's bank account, and he could hold it for safekeeping in the event my husband found out about my secret bank account. He told me his accountant he's known for over 20 years is a trusted friend. George suggested I send the money over to his accountant and start putting my paychecks and money there. George reminded me of how unhinged my husband is and how he might try to take my money. My attorney did tell me that during the divorce hearings, we would have to show our financial statements and bank accounts should the judge order it, and if my husband protested, it would complicate things. George was right, and he gave me the name of his accountant in Florida. I started sending money into the accountant's bank account. It was a man named Mark. I would put part of my paycheck and the money I got from pawning things, and I sent it over to Mark's account. A few times I dropped hints about wanting to visit him, but George said he was very busy closing up his contracts, closing his business, trying to get his money he was owed. He said he was also still recovering from his injury. I told him I want to be there to take care of him, but he insisted I stay, work, put money into Mark's account to save for our future. He kept telling me he was going to buy me beautiful rings, designer clothes, and shoes, but I told him all I want to do is meet you. I tried a few times to video chat with George once he was back in Florida. He told me when he was in Kabul it wasn't safe to video chat, and while in the hospital he didn't want me to see him in a hospital bed. I was working like crazy. I put about $8,000 into Mark's account to hold for me, so when my divorce started I had money hidden. I would take things every week to the pawn shop and leave just enough money to pay the household bills. My husband never questioned it. George told me I was doing the right thing and I felt like I was just in a frenzied daze when it came to money. Whatever George told me I should do, I never questioned it. I just did it. The weeks kept going on and I still had not made plans to be with George in person. I told him several times I was ready any time and I had to put in my time off from work. He kept telling me how he was getting things ready for my visit. Then George told me that his daughter had to go back to school as she was needed there to take some prep tests for the next quarter and she suddenly had to leave. I was a little upset as I had wanted to meet her. I told George, well, it'll be okay, it'll be just me and him. Then he told me that he still has not been paid his money from his contract and there was an investigation that's ongoing due to the security breach that caused him and his workers injury. He called me and confessed that he was broke and struggling due to the investigation as he had to pay out his workers and he'd still not gotten his contract pay. He was confused and frustrated. He told me he wants to meet, but he's living so poorly right now due to this investigation. He told me we likely wouldn't be able to talk a lot after this last call as his phone had not been paid and he fears he might lose his house as he's behind on his house payment. My heart broke for him and I felt sad. I told him I always want him to share what's going on in his life. He then asked me if I would be able to borrow him $2,500 to make his house payment and keep his phone on. He told me that the contract and investigation should close any day now. He told me once he got his money, he would pay for my divorce and move me to Florida to be with him. The request for money at the time didn't make me bat an eye. I told him, of course I'll help. You're the love of my life. I told him I have some savings I've been leaving with Mark in his account and I can ask Mark to transfer the money out. That's when George told me not to. 
He said he would figure things out. He said to keep that money for my divorce so we can figure things out and that he would take care of things. He did ask me, though, if I could buy him a $500 iTunes card to keep his data and phone running. I told him, of course, I want us to always be able to talk. And I went and bought him a $500 iTunes gift card. He told me I was his angel from heaven and he could always count on me and that we're bonded for life due to our oath. I tried again to video chat with George, but he refused. He said he was waiting for his card to load onto his phone, and then he had to make important business calls regarding his contract payout and security investigation. George called me for a voice chat later that night. He said he had to fly back to Kabul to give testimony in the investigation before a tribunal court so he could clear his company's name and get his contract payout. He said he would be in Kabul for two weeks, then fly back to Florida, and then we could meet. I was clearly upset by this, but at the same time, this was bringing us closer to being together. He could get his money, I could keep working and saving, and we could meet. Then I can serve my husband with his divorce papers. I told myself, it's okay. Everything's falling into place. George, though, had another issue. He had to pay for the flight to Kabul to give testimony and complete the cooperation in the investigation and to get his contract payout. The flight would be $3,000, including hotel stay. He didn't ask, but told me to go ahead and pay the flight and hotel for him. Once he completed his testimony, he would be able to collect his contract money. As I said, during this time, I felt like I was being controlled and I just did what he asked. I told him I could buy the flight ticket and pay for the hotel with my credit card as long as he was able to pay me back as soon as the contract payment was through and he could pay me the money. He told me that the investigation company was requiring him to return to Kabul for testimony and would book the flight and hotel, but they needed the payment. He gave me the name of a man in the UK who was in charge of booking and confirming his flight and hotel, but he needed $3,000 paid right now. He told me that we will always be joined together forever and to please send the money as he's packing. I went ahead and did a credit card payment and wired the money using a transfer service and not a bank transfer and charged it on my credit card, which at the time had a $5,000 limit. George sent me a picture of his flight itinerary and hotel information. He would be gone for two weeks. He was packing, and we voice chatted that night. He told me he would give his testimony, then collect his million dollars, come home to Florida for good. He said he would call me when he arrived in Kabul and told me how much he loved me. At this point, between the iTunes cards, the loans, putting money in Mark's account, I was close to $100,000 all in with spending money money from work, from pawning things, and paying his daughter's tuition. George called me when he arrived in Kabul. He said he was set to testify that next morning and hoped things wouldn't take long. He said some of his former injured workers were there and very angry with him. He was going to close out his business after all this was said and done and retire for good. George kept saying how he was worried about this hearing and testimony and how unsafe he felt and how he wished he could just fly home. But I told him to get his contract payout, leave, and it'll be a fresh start when he gets out of there and he could never look back. During his time in Kabul, I kept working, selling things, planning to leave my husband. Our household was like two roommates living together. You could feel the distance and hate between us. My husband spent time at the sports bar, and I spent time secretly selling my jewelry and items I didn't want, and dreamed of George in our new life. George said he was having a lot of problems in Kabul, that the hearing was a tribunal courtroom and it was very dangerous. He told me he wanted to run away and go home to Florida and forget his money, but I encouraged him to continue as it would be finished soon. I told him I was saving and getting my paperwork together to complete my divorce. I kept filling his head with images of us being together and hoped that that would encourage him to continue with his task in Kabul. George told me that they were questioning his security abilities as the breach in security had been his fault. He was upset by this. I told him, just get through it. As they try to drag people through the mud when you go to court, I'm sure my divorce will do the same, but when we get through it and start a new life, things will be great. The days went quick. 
and a week had passed. George asked me if I would be able to get him a $500 Amazon gift card as he could use it to barter and trade for food as he had no money yet and he was hungry and the hotel restaurant accepted gift cards. I did it without question and got him a $500 Amazon card, gave it to him through chat. He thanked me and told me how much he loved me and how he couldn't wait for me to be his bride. We would chat every morning, before work, and in the evening. He would tell me he was close to getting his contract payment. I pushed again about meeting and tried to video chat with him, and he said due to security issues in the hotel, he couldn't video, but he promised when he returned home, we would meet and things would be great. The final day George was set to be in Kabul, he called me crying. He told me that the tribunal found him guilty of negligence in the security case and voided his contract and he was out the $1 million, and that they told him he has to pay $300,000 to the workers and their family for the injury he caused. I was absolutely shocked and I told him this is ridiculous, just appeal it. Just leave and get out of there. He told me they were holding him in the hotel under a court order and he couldn't leave until he paid the money to the workers and he had no way to leave as they held his passport. He asked me to send $300,000 right away. I told George this is absolutely absurd and asked him for the name of the judge. I was going to call the embassy. He got angry with me and told me just send the money. I told him I don't have $300,000. He told me to sell some more of my husband's sports memorabilia. Then I paused. How did he know I sold it? Only his daughter knew this. I asked how he knew. There was silence on the phone, and he told me if I wasn't going to help him that I never loved him and he accused me of cheating on him with my husband. I've never seen this angry side of George with me. I told him I've never been unfaithful to him and I was going through all this so we could be together. He told me that I never loved him and he hung up and refused my calls. I tried for two days to call him and received no answer and no response to my text messages. I left voice messages crying, begging him to talk to me. He finally replied to me, telling me that he felt betrayed because I wouldn't help him. I told him I don't have that kind of money. I emailed his daughter asking if she told her father about me paying the tuition, but she never responded. I begged George to please call me. Call after call was ignored. I felt like I lost my best friend, my love, and soulmate. I was shattered and felt like a schoolgirl who lost her first love. I continued to call George and tried and tried to grab his attention, but to no avail. I thought we could work it out. Finally, George responded, telling me that he found someone else to pay the $200,000 fee to pay the workers but he was starving and suffering in Kabul with no food and sleeping in the road as they took his passport until he paid the other $100,000. I asked who gave you $200,000 and he said he got the money from a man who does loans but the interest on the loan is extremely high and because I refuse to help him, he'll likely lose his home and his daughter will be kicked out of school since he can't pay for her next quarterly testing fees at the school. He told me I ruined his life and he asked me if I'd ever loved him, if I believed in the oath that we had taken. I told George of course I love him and that I felt so lost without him, but I don't have $300,000. He asked me if I could send him $500 for food and a hotel to stay in. I told George I can't. That mark is holding most of my money and I needed what little I had to pay bills and help with household bills. Our home was paid for, but we had small loans against the house for a project we did a few summers ago, so I had to have my part of that loan payment. I explained this to George, and he asked me if I could get a loan against my home. I told him probably, but it would take weeks to qualify, and my husband would have to be involved as we own the home together. George told me that my husband was holding me back from being able to help, and he suggested that I leave him right now. George said if I really loved him, I would take charge and leave my husband, unless of course I was still wanting to be with my husband. It was the back and forth emotional manipulation game he played with me. George asked me if I was still giving money to Mark to hold for my divorce, and I told him, yes, I told you, of course. 
George asked me how much money I thought I could get for my car, and I told him close to $20,000. It was paid for and fairly new. He asked if I would sell my car to help him, and I told him I can't because it gets me to work. This triggered him again, and he told me that I never loved him. I was in tears by this point, begging him to please love me and understand I'm doing my best. He then told me he needs a $100 iTunes card as his phone is close to being shut off and that when I eat dinner tonight to remember that he's not eaten in days. I cried and cried to him on the phone. I felt helpless, angry, all the emotions at the same time. I was confused and depressed. My home life was horrible and now George needed me and I didn't know what to do. I bought an iTunes card for him and told him I can send him a couple hundred dollars to help with the hotel and some food. He told me to get a couple of Amazon gift cards instead so he can barter with the locals for a room to stay in and some food. I ended up getting a $100 iTunes card and two $100 Amazon gift cards. That was all the money I could spare. He thanked me for my effort. I cried to George asking when he would be home. I tried video chatting him, but he said his phone didn't have enough minutes and the $100 iTunes card just wasn't enough. He told me to get another $100 card, but I was broke at this point. It was before payday and my last check was for household utilities. George told me if I really loved him, I'd get a second job and send him the money until he can get home and after paying the last $100,000. I told him even a part-time job wouldn't pay $100,000. It was like he had no clue what jobs paid in this country, and he assumed I could make $100,000 in a few weeks. I told him at best I could work part-time and maybe take a couple hundred dollars home extra every week. George said he would seek out a second loan and pay off the 100000 He would figure it out, and he told me not to worry. It was a week later when George told me he was heading home to Florida. He was able to come up with the money. I told him I loved him so much and I wanted him home in the States so we could meet. George, though, was distant and felt cold to me. I asked him if he still loved me and he said, of course, but we needed to work on our relationship. This went back and forth between our chats. He told me that he swore on an oath to be with me forever and he took it serious, and if I knew what was good for me, I would too. I told him I wouldn't have gone through all this if I didn't feel serious about the relationship. He asked me how much money I was sending Mark every payday. I told him it wasn't as much as in the beginning, but I still planned on leaving my husband, and I did pay the retainer to hire the attorney. I did get the paperwork together. George told me to serve my husband with divorce papers, to go ahead, He'd be home soon, and he wanted me to come to Florida and start a new life. George told me to sell my car and everything I owned and just bring my personal belongings. I told George I will not sell my car as I wanted to drive it down to Florida. George told me he'd gotten in contact with an old martial arts friend, and they're going to open a school together when he returned. He said he was to fly home, and he showed me his ticket, and that his friend was starting the school and bought into him for it. He said things would be fine and to start leaving my husband. I felt like this was going to work out. His friend was helping him get set up and George was selling his home in Florida and buying a smaller home for us as his home was much too big for just us and he was using that money from the sale of his home to pay off the loans. It was like a good luck switch flipped and George was back to being loving again. He flew home to Florida and we picked up our voice chats. He even sent me a video of himself where he claimed to be in his backyard in Florida telling me he wanted to marry me, showed me his yard and how he was getting his home ready to sell. This was the motivation I needed and I told my attorney to serve my husband the divorce papers and I paid the retainer of the attorney fee to file the courts. I had a huge argument with my husband as I packed my personal items and decided to rent a room from someone I knew through work who was looking to make a little extra money by renting a room in their house. I packed up my things, brought them to my new room I would be renting, albeit temporary. I pawned my wedding ring and the remainder of my jewelry, most of which my husband had bought me through the years. It was enough money to pay a month's rental of the room 
which was 450 a month and everything else I needed to pay off. Things were moving fast. I don't know how, but my head was spinning. It was like I was moving a thousand miles an hour doing all this. We went from arguments and despair to George suddenly having a plan and having the money he needed and selling his home and moving. Us in love, me divorcing, the world was spinning like crazy. My heart felt nothing but love for George, despite all the obstacles and troubles. Things were falling into place. I confronted my husband and told him I filed for divorce on moving out. My husband acted like he was blindsided, but in reality, he knew this was coming. We were further apart than ever, and I told him I wanted this divorce and for things to be over. We could split everything and go our separate ways. But my husband wasn't going to agree. He told me that he knew I was having an affair with some man I met online, that he had seen my phone when I left it one day in the kitchen, and he knew about George. My husband thought George was some local guy from our town. He had taken photos of my phone with screenshots of me talking to George and our conversations, even some of our sexual chats. My husband had gone through everything and even came across photos I had taken for George. He said he was going to have his attorney serve me and take everything in the house, the investments, and I was guilty of infidelity. I could see the anger and hurt in my husband's eyes, but he also wasn't so innocent. I threw at him the years and nights at the sports bars, the neglect, the sports parties with his buddies, and how verbally abusive and how he threw things, broke glasses and plates during sporting events. I told him we can split everything and we never see each other again. He quizzed me on George. Where did he live? Was I moving in with him? I was vague and told my husband it was not his business. We're through and I wanted to be with George. I took my things and left. Moved into my co-worker's home. My room was small, but I was at peace and a stepping stone to my new life with George. I called George that night crying, telling him everything that was said between my husband and I. George was mad at me for leaving my phone in a place that my husband could find it. George had asked me several times during our relationship to keep things a secret until we met and then we could surprise my friends and family. I kept the relationship a secret from everyone, but he was mad my husband found my phone. I told George not to worry. Things would happen as they would, and if he gets everything, then him and I can just start over. The money doesn't matter. Just being with you, George, that's why I did all this. George was less than thrilled with my answer. He told me I should try and get as much money as I can and pull the investment money and sell the house while my husband's at work. I told him, no, I can't do that, and I took items and pawned them. George, though, had other plans. He told me to take some more of my husband's sports memorabilia and sell it. I deserve payments for years of neglect from my husband, was what he told me. George told me that God brought us together, and we signed this oath with our hearts and words, and he asked me again to say our oath again out loud. George told me he was lighting candles to secure our oath and make it stronger. He told me he would never leave me and our bond is forever. George told me that the next day when my husband is at work, I need to go to the house, get the rest of my things, and sell off things in the house. I told him I would think it over. We said our good nights and stopped talking on the phone after our hours-long conversations. When I went back to my house the next day to get the remainder of my stuff, I opened the door to find trash, food, and bottles all over. The living room was a mess, and I started looking at that stupid big screen TV, the one that my husband spent hours staring into watching football, baseball, and basketball every weekend when he should have been with me. I packed my things, passing his sports room. I glanced at the boxes of cards and laughed to myself, thinking about how he's never managed to notice the missing cards. I grabbed one of his baseballs on the way out and threw it into the TV, breaking the screen. I left the home. I didn't care about the house or its contents. I cared only about George and our new life. George and I spoke that night. He asked what I took from the house and sold. I told him how I threw a baseball into the TV and broke it. George wasn't happy. He told me I should have sold the TV, sold the sports stuff. I told him I don't care about money. I just want to be with him. And I told him I would be driving out there in two weeks to meet him. I cried to him how much I loved him. He stayed in silence on the phone. 
Then he told me he had to go, and he hung up. I asked him what I did wrong in Messenger, but he didn't answer. It was a whole day before George responded to me, telling me that he was sorry, but this wasn't going to work. I called him repeatedly, and he didn't answer. I yelled in Messenger for him to answer the phone. When he finally did, George asked me if I loved him no matter what. I told him, of course, I left my home, my life. I was down to a few boxes, my clothing, my car. I loved him with all my heart. He asked me if there was anything that would change my mind. I told him he was scaring me and asked him what he was talking about. I'm divorcing my husband and leaving my life behind for him and for our love. George then told me that we needed to talk and made me promise I wouldn't run away. I told him to tell me what was going on. He kept telling me that I'd be angry, then he would hang up. I called him again and he said his phone was having connection issues as he was low on minutes. He asked me if I could buy him a $100 iTunes card to keep his phone going as he had something very important to say. I was so mentally exhausted, but as usual, I bought the card, gave it to him, and then I asked him to call me. But he didn't. I hit the video call button, but it was declined. I called on voice chat several times. George finally answered, telling me he was sorry. He was so deep in love with me, but he felt so guilty. I asked him what he feels guilty for, as I was confused. Part 2 is going to be out shortly to conclude this story. The story was so long and had so many details that we had to break it into two parts. So uh, if you're listening to this video, part two should be out shortly. Or if you're listening to this video later on, part two might already be out. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.